Welcome to Intrinsic Motivation from a Homie's Perspective podcast, where we meet experts from all walks of life to learn their intrinsic motivation so that they can share it with the world. What do we have in store today? Stay tuned to find out more. Okay, well, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everybody out there in podcast land. You are in tune to another episode of Intrinsic Motivation from a Homie's Perspective. This is Hamza. And I am David. And today we, today we have a, a, a great guest. I'm really excited about interviewing this author. Uh, we are going to talk about the myths of the 1%, which I'm sure many people have any, uh, plenty of questions and we'll cover in this hour, but also this award-winning author lives in Uruguay, and we are going to spend some time to talk about expat life as well. Do they go together? Can only one percenters be expats? Yes or no? I think we'll find out in this podcast. Without further ado, I'd like to welcome Ivan Obolesky to the, Obolesky to the podcast. Welcome, Ivan. Hey, thank you very much. Glad to be here. Yeah, sure, we got you to laugh in the first minute, so that's a good sign. Yeah, this is always good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I think uh, the first direction we're going to talk about is the myths of the 1%, and then we can get into the expat. We may have to have you back on and have a separate conversation about expat life, uh, but if you could talk a little bit about your background and how, what was the uh, impetus for writing the book for uh, Eye of the Moon? Okay, um, my background, um, I grew up in, I was born in New York, and uh, my parents were very well off. Uh, we had, I mean, the one reason I knew that we were probably better off than most people was because I had, a, I was driven to school by a chauffeur, and none of the other kids were, so that was one thing that definitely set it apart. Uh, we, I met a lot of people, they were socially prominent I mean, we had butlers, maids, and things like that, and um, I grew up in that in that world. My parents divorced, and my father had a very large house up in Rhinebeck, New York, and um, my, you know, he would, uh, the only time we would see him would be at lunches at the St. Regis Hotel, so he would take us out, and of course, what do you do with an 8, 9, 10, 11, 12-year-old kid? you know, you're having lunch, so you got to talk about something. So he would tell us stories. And one of the most intriguing was about my grandmother, Alice Astor. And she was a daughter of John Jacob, uh, sister to Vincent Astor. And uh, she died reading the Egyptian Book of the Dead. And that was that was quite something. <laughs> I was like, what? And, uh, yeah, he, would, he, he elaborated on that to a degree. But um, it turns out that she was very much into Egyptology. She was a good friend of Aldous Huxley. And um, she had a whole spiritualist thing going on. And I thought that was very intriguing. Uh, we had a nanny that went up to Rhinebeck with us, and then, of course, she refused to ever go back because she apparently missed, she ran into my grandmother wandering around the house. Um, of course, she was dead, so that really sort of sent her over the edge, and um, she refused to ever go back. Now, we, as kids, we were lived a, a relatively sheltered life uh, off the, uh, you know, we were seen and not necessarily heard, so to speak. But um, we did catch rumors on this. And of course, being kids, we would always try and figure out, well, what really was going on? And over the years, we, you know, we pieced together that, yeah, that my um, grandmother wanted to let my father know that, um, you know, she would return from the dead and did so on occasion. And that was absolutely fascinating. I tried to see a ghost, so I figured, man, this was just my opportunity. <laughs> no such luck. I never saw one. I mean, I really tried, but it just did not happen. So um, we that's how we grew up. Um, let's put it this way. Um, I do have one of the, one of my, I guess, 
interesting elements is I did manage to pee on JFK, which was I was two years old, but you know, hey, that was something. And then I did manage to see him later at the White House um, when I was ten, and I was just freaking out because I was not sure whether he remembered that incident or not. But he was very generous and. So no, you know, it just uh, just never even crossed anybody's you know radar. So that was a very cool thing. So that was sort of how I grew up. I mean, it was prep schools, and then um, you know, uh, eventually, of course, you always have the rebellious kids. So you know, I I left the family, and um, you know, so I, I could say that I know an awful lot about the one percent without necessarily being really part of it. I hope that answers the question. No, it, it does. It, it gives us a lot of, or it gives me a lot of insight. Uh, I guess to be topical, the first question I would have to ask is, what's the difference between old money and new money? And I preface that by saying topically that Jeff Bezos is in the middle of a divorce right now. His wife's about to be one of the richest people on the planet, and they didn't sign a prenup. So <laughs> they would they be considered new money? And what's the, dif- the difference between old money and new money? I think um, the main difference that I can see, and I, and I thought about this quite a bit because um, it is a really good question. I don't think it's a really a question of you know how much money you make. It's more a question of the one percent are interested, I think, in a legacy. And what I mean by that is that they want to give something. You know, they want to be remembered. I mean, we all have, I guess, dreams of some sort of immortality, and I suppose when you have an awful lot, one of the things that really is important is, you know, how are you going to be remembered by history? How are you going to be remembered by, you know, in the future? And one of the ways you do that is you build foundations, you set up gift giving, you do such a thing so that you have a legacy that is passed on onto the generations. And to, to that degree, I suppose, you know, you are immortal. I mean, uh, the ancient Egyptians tried that. Um, if somebody failed to speak your name or the last time anybody, you know, spoke your name was the time you really died. I mean, you died twice, once when your body died and the second one was when your name was forgotten. So mm-hmm. that is, a, that I think is a big element of what the 1% is. I mean, you have also definitions. I mean, the, you know, 1%, meaning, you know, if you make over 400000 or 700000 or something like that, uh, depending upon which survey you look at. And, and I don't think that qualifies as a 1%er. A 1%er usually has accumulated a fairly large and hefty sum, probably north of $10 million, you know, in at least, and I would say closer to 50 and it's um, when you're in that sort of range, well, you know, life is good. You don't have particularly worries. You just have to worry about not losing the whole damn thing. That's pretty much it. Sure. Uh, it, it makes me also think of Warren Buffett and Bill Gates and some others, uh, notable mm-hmm. people that are not giving their children access to that huge transfer of wealth. They're getting a percentage of that because they – want them to kind of grow on their own type of deal. Is, is that a mindset as well? I think so. I mean, when we grew up, I mean, we were the most penny pinched of anybody. I mean, all my friends had more money than I did. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Allowances, I mean, we were cut to the bone. <laughs> you know, it was just one of those things. You did not have a lot of pocket money. And uh, I think that was an attitude that was fostered that you – because – it takes great amounts of risk to make a lot of money. I mean, you've really got to lay it on the line and often more than once. But once you make it, I mean, the really big money has to, and the really smart people, they have to change. They can no longer, you cannot take the risks that you took when you were at the beginning. Right now, you then have to go to the entire other side of the coin which is wealth preservation. And and the only way to to really successfully operate a business is to cut expenses to the bone. And so you have to be able to expend a great deal of money um, in order to make it. And then you've got to be able to reverse that and just, you know, chop it off at the knees. And usually what happens is families who are not inculcated in that idea of how to use money 
Um, well, they figure, what the hey, you know, go buy a Mercedes. You know, Bentleys are cool. You know, and off they go. Well, you know, you turn around, and next thing you know, that family fortune is down the toilet, and it's gone within three generations. So when you think of the real 1%, you're talking about people that are taking an extraordinarily long-term view and want a legacy that is continued and oftentimes they had very altruistic motivations uh, maybe not initially <laughs> i think really being serious capitalists but um at some point you know you go you know i'm getting older here and i you know what's going to happen to me and and where is this whole thing going to and you've got to ask those questions and i think those that build the big legacies um thought that part through and said you know well we're going to do something about that and so you have you know hospitals um, museums I know that um, our family did an awful lot with um, many museums in New York City and uh, to you know to foster them and to keep them there and um, I think that's an, an important legacy and, and a very good thing to do actually one thing, other other thing I think about is the recent passing of, of George Bush Sr., and mm -hmm. I would put them in the 1%. And one thing that they would highlight is that they were very frugal. You never saw them displaying huge amounts of wealth. And so you're saying it has to be a family thing. Uh, what happens is, and you may, I want to get your take because you said you were more the rebellious kid, and there's always a rebellious kid. But overall, the family has to be on one page, or how do you ensure that that legacy stays intact? Well, I think one of the things you've got to choose those people that you, you know, I guess, intend to bequeath it to. Uh, there's a couple of ways that's usually done. Um, secondly, you can create various trusts and things like that, which then takes the... Um, the legacy out of the hands of the kids and puts it in the hands of a bank or something to that effect. Um, and there are various ways to do that, uh, but they get some sort of funding to keep them going and that type of thing. And unless you get somebody who's, you know, a very, you know, who's, who's got that same sort of vibe going, the Rockefellers did that really, really well. Um, you know, the Rockefeller fortune was continuously passed down one onto the other. And, um, you know, what happened to the other Rockefellers? Well, you know, they got stipends. <laughs> you know, it's mm. fine. You know, they shut up. You know, they're off there and they can spend all they want. But there are limits. And, um, and, and, and that works just as well. I think, you know, the Bushes definitely, uh, they have a legacy. And... Um, when you have a legacy, you want to be remembered in a good way. <laughs> That's how you do it. <laughs> sure. Um, on the other side of that coin is uh, with the Bushes being frugal, the uh, Trump family is not seen as frugal. They're very uh, flashy, if you will. And so what they would be considered, if you talk about legacy with Donald's father and, and his grandfather, uh, they had access to wealth. Uh, what, what's your take on I think they're two different sides of the coin with the Bushes and the Trumps. I think so, too. I mean, I think you'll have to wait for another generation to really get a, a view on that. I mean, I remember, I mean, at, I was at Miro Largo, they, you know, their place down in Palm Beach. I remember when, you know, meeting Margaret Merriweather Post there. <laughs> you know, this was before. And, uh, you know, they... Uh, she passed her fortune on to her daughter, Dina Merrill. And Dina is still, you know, she's a really sharp cookie. I mean, that, that woman what is really quite clever and has been able to manage things. And as I said, it goes, you know, generation to generation. But, um, you know, the Trumps have about, you know, we have to go and watch them for about another, maybe another generation at least before you really see it. Um, and then, you know, but obviously I think Trump wants a legacy. I mean, who doesn't? And I think that's, mm -hmm. you know, what that will be is, is anybody's guess. I mean, he's very interesting because he's becoming a president during what, I don't know, I guess is called the fourth turning part. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with that. Um, about every 80 years, which is four generations of 20 years each, usually you get a major shift in you know the political climate, and uh, we're running into it at the moment. Um, and 
one of the last times this happened uh, was, you know, Lincoln, believe it or not, was a, um, a fourth-turning president. He was one of the most hated presidents in the world. Um, in fact, they even killed him. So. <laughs> that, mm-hmm. so that's how much he was disliked. So, you know, again, you have to sort of weigh that against the whole historical thing. But um, we'll, see, we'll see what happens. Um, I'd be, I'm interested. I mean, I'm definitely, you know, interested <laughs> to see how that all shakes out. Yeah, I, well, I mean, you just <laughs> – sorry, David. I, I just kind of jumped in there. I know he's probably chopping at the bit. Oh, no. I, I just wanted to just <laughs> – it was just more of a curious curiosity when you mentioned that you kind of became aware that your life was a little bit different than others around you when you, you were, you know, being brought to school and, and with a chauffeur. I was just curious, <clears throat> how did you – how did you, you know, growing up, how did your classmates treat you? Were, were you, like, teased about stuff like that or? or I, you know? not really. Most of them were pretty wealthy in their own right. I mean, I went to school with, you know, Alfred Vanderbilt, Charles Scribner, Harry Steinway. I mean, it went on. I mean, it was quite a list. But I, there were people that really did not like the fact that I went to school. And, you know, I remember one kid in particular taking a big swing at me and, you know, saying, well, take that, you know, um, now what are you going to do, you and all your money? Where's your chauffeur now? You know, as he, you know, punches me in the face. And um, now, of course, you know, I'm sitting there going, my gosh, what am I going to do with this? I mean, my legacy, of course, was um, uh, a military family stretching way back into Russian history. So, you know, my thought was, you know, you shouldn't be taking this lying down, dude. You got to do something about mm-hmm. this. So I thought about it quite a while until finally I said, well, there's only one thing to do, and that's just attack. So um, I did manage to find the kid, and, you know, and I did attack. And that was, um, I felt better about it, but I realized that I really needed a little bit of work on self defense. <laughs> So I took up boxing and various things like that, and and that tended to smooth that out. But it only happened once. Most of the time, uh, nobody really cared, and and, and that was a good thing. And um, also, I was not necessarily one to really, you know, you know, be a, you know, just a flaunted all the time. That I, I don't think that really wasn't my way of doing things. Mm, okay. Yeah, I was thinking that there, there's there's this. Um unspoken rule like we can afford to have have a chauffeur to bring us to school as well yet we don't and you did oh yes yeah well that was also because you know you had my my whole family to deal with i mean we had like there were so many half sisters stepsisters brothers you know real family it was it was a real circus and getting everybody to school in the morning, and my mom was not about to sit there and deal with that without some help. And so, <laughs> you know, forget about it. It's going to happen. But you know what? On, you know, we're going to pay somebody to do it. <laughs> That's how that worked. Absolutely. I do want to go back for a second because uh, you're talking about a fourth turning president, and you had said the last time was 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 uh, Abraham Lincoln. And what's interesting the... about the go ahead. I'm sorry. I was thinking when you were talking about Abraham Lincoln, you know, we think of uh, – when we think of assassinations, we think of Abraham Lincoln. We think of John F. Kennedy. We may even think of attempted assassinations with uh, Reagan. But with a, a simple Wikipedia search, you see that these uh, attempts were quite often to, to presidents throughout time. Uh, they're just not highly publicized. So it's just interesting when you're talking about the major shift in a political climate. That is correct. And, um, you know, it, it seems so we every 80 years or so we get into these major shifts and, um, you know, where I mean, in the sense of, of Lincoln, it was redefining the government. I mean, one of the problems with the Civil War was it was proof positive that the Constitution, in fact, didn't work. And that was, um, I mean, not a lot of people say these things, particularly the constitutionalists. <laughs> I said, to her, they go, what? And I said, no, you know, it's, but it, the fact of the matter is, look, when, you know, you have, you know, hundreds of thousands of people, you know, taking up arms and killing each other, um, and you think that 
you know, and, and what was the reason for this? Well, you know, again, the way the government was set up, I mean, plus, of course, the economic and social situation at the time, but one would expect that a constitution that was, you know, would be able to, to at least handle it in such a way so that it didn't require, you know, an all-out civil war. Well, that did happen in the United States. And so what needed to be done was how do you redirect the country after such an event? And um, strangely enough, I think it was one of those things that sort of evolved that didn't, where somebody said, oh yeah, here's what we're going to do. This is plan, you know, B39. No, what happened was they, uh, he did the Gettysburg Address and he referenced uh, again the you know declaration of independence by saying this is going to be a government for the people by the people and this was a unique idea where he immediately switched from sort of like the roman view of government which was what the united states was based on initially mm -hmm. to the more grecian view um which was more democratic i mean there are no democracies on the planet. Um, you know, people call them democracies, but they're actually just representative forms of government, not strictly democracies. But in this sense, the by the people, for the people, was an extraordinary concept that has lasted and is now being reappraised as of now because it was found out that the government for the people, by the people, cannot afford for the people, by the people. And that's part of the issue that's, you know, sort of, it's coming to the surface. And, and as I said before, it, it was very unclear of how the country was going to heal itself after the Civil War. And I think at this point, it is just as unclear of how the United States is going to heal itself internally. And um, this is still to be played out. And uh, as I said, it's going to be very interesting to watch. Absolutely. Uh, because when you were talking about the founding fathers, there uh, were, I remember in school, we were reminded of Adam Smith, the wealth of nations. And mm -hmm. the, the premise was, we can't, everyone can't have equal access. I mean, no one would be, I mean, who would clean up or who would do, you know, I'm being very flippant right now, but it was pretty much two different societies the way it was set up. And so on one hand, you have people believing for the people, by the people, but as you eloquently highlighted, it's never been set up that way. Exactly, and, and it, it does have a problem. I mean, the problem is simply interest rates. I mean, if you just have a 2% a differential, um, I mean, over a 20, 30-year time period, you know, pop it to 40 years, and you have uh, an automatic disparity of wealth that is huge, that is almost insurmountable. Yes. Uh, the other part of that that I, I want to ask you uh, with the political climate and being a one percenter, you know, there is a school of thought that in the current climate, we have a government shutdown that's talking about the wall, but that's really just on the surface with what is really happening behind the scenes. Do you, do you have a take on that? I think, you know, it's, it's interesting. I, again, I don't have a lot of familiar. I always get the idea that there is a great deal of information that we don't necessarily have access to. Um, and just from, you know, when I was with my family and stuff like that, um, you got to be privy to sort of, there's things going on and then there are things going on and then there's what's really going on. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, we are way, you know, off the beaten track on that. I mean, one of the interesting things is having to do with, you know, everybody's incensed about the data that's, you know, being given out here, there, and everywhere, and, and, and that's where a lot of focus has been. But what people don't understand, it was never the data that was so important. What it was important was the connections, because um, it was a really interesting um, – uh, actually started the casinos in Las Vegas where they were trying to, you know, to get the card counters. You know, how do you find these card counters? Well, one particular security firm came up with some brilliant ideas of actually interlacing a whole bunch of data sources. And what they did was they began to map the connections 
of many of the people that were arriving in Vegas. And then they found out that there were some key connections and that you could pretty much know your card counters by who they connected to. And it was that connection which was so important. And then when Facebook came out, of course, you know, I think this was the intelligence coup of the century. Actually, it was probably the intelligence coup of the last thousand years was mm -hmm. Facebook because you automatically, right before your very eyes, had the most important piece of information you could get. And that is who was talking to who. You don't need to know necessarily what they're talking about. You need to know who they're talking to. <laughs> and when you mm -hmm. know that you can do a great deal of things. But of course, you know, as I said, there's always wheels within wheels. And right now everybody's saying, well, it's the data and everybody has data on you. And then you go, oh, and, but, you know, in some ways it's, I mean, it sound, I guess I sound like a conspiratist, but it's, it's, it's like, you know, it's, you know, you're looking in the wrong direction, people. You know, that's, not, that's not what's really important. It's the connections. And uh, it, it's anyway, those are my views on that. So I suppose, you know, and, and I think also in the 1% end of it, just to tie that in, it, one of the great things about the 1% is they know everybody. Mm -hmm. You know, and you cannot, you know, undervalue that fact. When you know somebody, boy, it makes a difference. I mean, you know, again, going on to the expat thing, it really does make a difference. If you know somebody who's a mover and sh shaker, it's, it's amazing how much can get done how quickly. And if you don't, it's amazing how, many, how long you have to stand in the line. <laughs> yes. yes yeah. indeed. That makes them the same. It's not, it's not what you know, it's who you know. <laughs> Well, I think that's still true, and I and it, it is. And you know, how do you get access to that people? I mean, it's it's nowadays it's even more difficult because yeah, it's the email and stuff like that. But you know, there's all sorts of ways to you know to buffer so that you know people do not have access. But you know, once you know, oh yeah, it's an old family friend. Oh yeah, sure, I know I know your dad. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Next thing you know, sure, come on by, we'll talk. Yeah. Yeah, it was interesting that you talked about the connections because with uh, with Facebook, it's not highly known that before they started, they they sought the expertise of what was happening in Vegas, and of not so much for the connections, but what was it that made people continue to gamble? And so, with the likes and the shares and the internal um, satisfaction, satisf uh, the satisfaction. Uh, <laughs> satisfaction that you got from the likes and the and the shares, it kept people on their platform. But they their underlying uh, premise of getting that information was dealing with the the titans at Vegas, which which you were what you're saying to tie it in is it, it probably was just the connections. Like, hey, if you want to grow your business and grow this way, uh, talk to my guy here in Vegas, and he'll kind of get you sorted out. Well, yeah, there was a whole. I did a, I think I did a series of articles on that. I forget where I put it, but um, it's in one of them. I, I wrote about a hundred articles, but yeah, that whole Vegas connection, you know, was, you know, I sort of elaborated on quite, quite a bit, and um, you know, on how that went, and then you know, it's it's a it's a fascinating area, and then also how you apply, you know, mathematics and gambling, believe it or not to, uh, you know, outcomes in terms of, you know, having to do with, you know, who's going to be, you know, what is going to be the outcome of, of, a, of a probabilistic event, um, whether it's, uh, I mean, again, a lot of this was used on, I, I don't know if you recall, but there was a, we lost a couple of atom bombs off the coast of Spain a while back in the 60s. It um, wasn't totally advertised, but um, it did happen, and it did hit the news, but the problem was nobody could figure out where the damn things were. So what occurred was this um, particular captain who was a statistician, you know, they, they went through all the models and they said, well, we should be digging out here. And they, they went and they, uh, they looked at those areas, nothing, nothing, nothing. So finally the guy said, you know, well, this is getting a little ridiculous here. So I have one idea, which was nobody seems to have any vested interest in you know what the outcome is it's all like the mathematics of it and you can play with the math all you want and it's fun but he said okay let's play for let's pay for booze so he came up with the fact well let's have some i got some really good scotch here um all right you know whoever gets closest you know 
hey, you know, you get the booze. And all of a sudden, every, all the little statistical, statistical team got together and they said, okay, let's rethink this. We're playing for money. And so um, they eventually found them. Uh, and, uh, and that was why. And it was quite a ways difference because nobody was quite – everybody, you know, said there's – well, this is the way it's supposed to be done. You know, and then there's the way, okay, well, you know, in the real world, it works slightly different. And, if, you know, if I had to put my money on, I'd go with this way. And they went with the latter way. And that was a, that was a whole interesting thing that came out of that in terms of crowdsourcing, you know, information and how you can – hone in on, you know, key elements, whether in, in the areas of search and rescue or even in the sense of, you know, well, what is the next best thing? The same captain eventually got, you know, up the ladder and uh, wanted to use this to come up with a, believe it or not, a, uh, it's almost like a, a terrorist market whereby people would take contracts to find out, you know, you would buy a contract on what would be the next, you know, big thing that would happen in, in an effort to, uh, to, to source that. And um, now, of course, that went way underground <laughs> really fast. <laughs> mm-hmm. We don't know where that is now. It's still running around, I'm pretty sure, but I just don't know where. <laughs> anyway, there you go. Yeah, I think that that's the the you know the fun, good and bad of you know the myths of the one percent, right? Because just listening to you, there it, it reminds me of of college. Like if somebody grew up in a small town and then they go away to college, and in their small town, you know, it's very myopic and they ran around the same people. But when they went to college, they met so many different people, different walks of life, so they learned so much more. Um, and so when I, I would liken that to people that are not 1% and they're kind of pointing the finger, like they're taking control of everything because they don't have access to the inside. So it's just really interesting listening to your perspective. I, I, and I think that's really true. I mean, the one re- reason to go to Stanford is, I mean, true, it's a great school, and you could learn some serious stuff in there. But, you know, if you were a real mathematician dude, you'd probably head to MIT as opposed to Stanford. But the reason you go to Stanford is because of the connections, because of the people that are there and the people that you will meet. And um, also now it has a reputation, you know, Google founders were there. You know, there's a lot of people went through Stanford and um, all of a sudden it becomes one of the place of to know who you know. And um, I must admit, you know, for myself, I was never a real big, you know, you know, person that went out and, and spoke to people. Um, one of the things I think my grandfather did, I mean, he, he was a, uh, you know, he was born in St. Petersburg, you know, part of the definite 1% there. And, um, you know, then, of course, that all blew up. And then he, you know, went to, he went to London, married Alice, and, you know, which also another 1%. But, um, you know, he, he, he never burned any of his bridges. I mean, the guy was an extraordinary example of, the, of, of doing that. Me, on the other hand, I mean, I, I burned them at the drop of a hat, which is <laughs> why I'm in Uruguay right now as opposed to sitting on top of New York City. But there you go. <laughs> you know what? You may, When you're talking about Stanford, I, I do want to stay there for two seconds, if you don't mind, sure. uh, because – uh, we, we were talking a little bit. I'm just, just trying to connect some of the dots that you're covering because you're covering some really huge things that I think our audience want, will gravitate to. So in, I think it was 2007, and in 2007, Stanford had done a study, and they were talking about connections and the human, uh, human proclivity to stay around people that they know. And so in that study – at the time, MySpace was really huge, but if I were in high school and I was a jock, then my jock and cheerleader buddies were still on Facebook. And if I was like a druggie or in the music industry artist type French person, I was on MySpace. And then in the same study, see, and this is a, a you can look it up in 2007. No, no, I believe you. It's just, but it's so right. You know what I mean? Yes. Yeah, like it doesn't matter if we're online or not. People are going to gravitate to it. And so they did the art. They did the military too, and they were like, "If I'm an officer, I'm on my wife and family. You were all on Facebook, but if I'm a private or under guy, underling, then I'm on MySpace." And so uh, 
the other thing that really happened was on MySpace, you were like, yeah, I'm a, you know, I'm a, I, for let's just use music. So I'm a, I'm a rapper or something like that, right? But on Facebook, you saw that, oh, I'm a rapper, but I also listen to like Chopin and stuff like that. So it showed your range, and Facebook was easier to make those connections, whereas MySpace, you could not. Yes, absolutely. I think that's true. And, you know, and, it is what you, your connections are so important. Mm-hmm. And the the other part, when you, you mentioned something that was really huge, um, Malcolm Gladwell, I don't know if you follow him. That He's an oh, author. Absolutely. He oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah, I, I've read all his stuff. <laughs> awesome, I awesome. So do you listen to his I, podcast? I don't. I read more than I listen to podcasts. I'm sorry okay. to say. But, I know, know we're on a podcast. I'm glad you made it to our podcast. I know. I, know. <laughs> I have, you know, my, you know, my, 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 um, I guess a niece-in-law is, uh, you know, she's a big podcaster, and you know, she's got one of the top-rated shows. And you know, have I listened to it? No, but I have to. You know, it's one of those things. It's it's a going thing. We, I mean, with my book, you know, trying to get saying, wow, maybe you should get that out on audio. You know, I mean, it's a whole other thing. Anyway, continue. Yeah. I'm sorry. Well, I will say just for my selfish my selfish take is I am always on the road. And so I love listening to audio, so audio books, podcasts, what have you. Um, I could just get more done that way just from a productivity standpoint. So you're missing out on a whole growing audience that would miss out on your book if you don't have it in that format. Yes, and I, and I think you're right, although we've, we've tried to – we actually were just about to do it, but then you know something went over with the, vo- with the voiceover artist. Um, I'm actually quite familiar with that whole thing. We do voiceovers. My wife does voiceovers. You know, for, we do Toshiba training and things like that. And so you know, we had a whole studio you know, in Glendale <laughs> to do that. But it's like and, – and I agree. I think it, it, is, uh, it is definitely a way to do it. Um, I'm really glad is that I've always, I've, at least for the last you know, 10, 12, 20 years, I've worked it out. So I work out of my home, so I don't have to commute. So I, I'm, I tend to not have to you know, have that you know, pop it onto a podcast and then you know, drive for 40 minutes. And, and I think that's – but I, I agree. I think that it, it is a tremendous it's, – it's a lost income area, one that actually I have to explore at some point. It's just – it's fraught with peril, let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> so the last thing about a podcast is uh, with uh, Malcolm Gladwell. He has revisionist yes. history. And yes. he was talking about kissing the ring, and he was talking about, like you were saying, connections and endowment. And he's like, Stanford has the largest endowment on the planet, and they don't need it. But as you were saying, it's kind of like you got to kiss the ring with those connections to keep those endowments going, whereas your little state school is, you know, <laughs> they're not faring as well. That's exactly right. And then, you know, all of a sudden, you know, somebody sits there and goes, you know, well, you know, who wants to invest here? Well, Yale University. And you go, oh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you'd sit up and take notice. What do you mean Stanford wants to buy that? But, you know, it's also true that, you know, they, they have a huge legacies. And, you know, when you have, you know, I mean, when you have close to a billion dollars being able to sit there and, and you can you can definitely move things. Luckily, well, we don't know that. They haven't necessarily gone into the political thing. You know, again, I think that's going to be another interesting sort of thing that happens in the future is, you know, will those for public organizations, whether it's California teachers or, you know, again, Stanford or many of the other endowments, whether they're going to start swinging according to the political wind. Mm-hmm. And, and then that's a whole other concept. Always, you know, just to add fuel to the fire. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I do want to just segue a little bit, um, but before, I, I want to talk a little bit about Uruguay because I was just looking at the time and like, oh, my goodness, we can continue talking about the 1% forever, but we only have a limited amount of time. Um, I wanted to know if you're familiar with the red pill folks. The red pill folks. No, I'm not. Tell me. Okay, so with the red pill, uh, it's usually men, and what they're doing is uh, – because this is related to legacy. Mm-hmm. So 
they are uh, men that are all walks of life, but in many cases they're like 30, 40, 50, 60. And they, you know, I, I, I go to school, go to college, get a good job, get married, get divorced, lose everything, and living back in my one bedroom like I did in college. And now I'm not going to have children anymore or the, the court system, the family law system is against men. And, and now because of that, they're not going to get married. They're not going to have children. And there's a, a small concern of maybe this is the beginning of the end because there's no incentive to get married anymore and thus pass along a legacy. Interesting. I think there is something to that, but I think that's also part of a much more wider based issue that has to do with um, crowding and what we're seeing, particularly in Japan, um, mm -hmm. in terms of birth rates. It was funny because I, I did a series of articles on this in terms of how, what happens when you have, uh, again, the density of population grows to a certain degree. And it was often thought that, um, you know, it's the individual that creates the crowd. Well, according to complexity theory, um, an organization has you know, particularly a complex structure that's been built from individual elements has a downward causation on those elements themselves, much like um, you take a, a green, a regular old grasshopper and you put him together with a whole bunch of his cronies and they start rubbing against each other and they turn into locusts. Um, so it is, in a sense, it's the, uh, the crowd, you know, creates the individual just as much as the individual creates the crowd. And we know that there are squirrels in the uh, boreal forests in Canada who, when, you know, they're hungry, they don't reproduce. And that's how they you know, prevent themselves from going on. There was a whole bunch of studies that were done, particularly regarding rats and free feeding them. <laughs> and then you came up with something. I, I, it was a Canadian who did this. The name escapes me right off the head, off the top of my head. But uh, he came, there was a, a type of mouse that was uh, produced during this thing called the beautiful ones. And the beautiful ones were, all they did was sit in a corner and groom themselves and look pretty. They were really cuddly and really nice. They didn't procreate, and they were actually stupider <laughs> than the normal mouse. But anyway, we, and that was a result of, um, and what was really interesting was that when you free-fed all these, these, these mice and, and they had them living around rats and they were running about, um, their populations exploded, leveled off, and then crashed precipitously. Um, and that's a really interesting question. I mean, obviously, people aren't rats. And um, the human, you know, has a, a, a tremendous cooperation component genetically, uh, mm -hmm. which I think is really maybe decisive on how it is that we are able to, you know, to work, you know, together, you know, much better in some ways than, say, rats would or or maybe other creatures, because we have that cooperative gene, and I think that's one of the key elements that, you know, actually gives me, a, in spite of all the things that are happening on the planet, a somewhat more positive view of our future, because men and women are designed to work things out. <laughs> That's what we're yes. supposed to do. And um, yes. it's actually a genetic element. So with that in mind, you know, I, th I think we have a chance. But I, I do think that we're, gonna, we're seeing a tr precipitous drop in birth rates because, remember, the, uh, the birth rate has to be – well, there's a, a number, I think. I forget what the number is even called at this point. But it's got to be about 2.1 because, frankly, there's a little more males – you know, being born than females. Uh, but when you take that into account, you actually must be over, the reproductive rate has to be over about 2.1 in order to sustain a population. Well, except for various countries in Africa, almost every one of the European or developed nations are below two and actually, you know, maybe even as low as 1.6. So what that means, and, and actually that may be the reason behind that whole immigration thing in Europe, which was, I think, 
one of these brilliant ideas of, well, how we fix the fact that our population is aging is we just get a whole bunch of people that are 30 years old who can do the work for us. <laughs> well, that didn't quite work the way it was planned. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, uh, but, but those are actual facts. And, you know, whether somebody in, you know, in, in Brussels actually sat down and thought that, I don't know. But I have a funny feeling they did. At least somebody did the research and said, you know, boys, we're in trouble. We've got an aging population that's going to require benefits, and we've got no workers to have to sit there and support it. So mm -hmm. what are we going to do? Yeah. What are we going to do? <laughs> what are we going to do? And well, somebody <laughs> came up with a bright spark on this one, but um, but I think yeah, I think you when, I, when we talk about birth rates and stuff, I think we're talking about a much larger situation, and one which is just only now really beginning to get attention, but actually mm -hmm. has been going on now for about two, three, four years. Plus, we have the whole virtual world, which is going to be a whole other concept. You know, where you don't have to do shit, you know? I mean, part of yeah. my friend. Oh, you know, no worries, no worries. It, it was funny, uh, now that we're at past holiday season, uh, we were looking at the past four years now. Every year there's been incremental increases from uh, Black Friday and Cyber Monday. However, they are always dwarfed by Singles Day. And Singles Day is the largest a day in China where because they had that population control where they can only have one kid, they have an overabundance of men there, and so the, there is a, a, a imbalance between men and women. So they have this big singles day where they just, you know, shop for themselves. But the <laughs> fact that they – yeah, but the fact that they mushroomed Black Friday and Cyber Monday, we laugh. I mean, we're like, hey, yeah, Black Friday, Cyber Monday. I mean, it's so minuscule compared to China's. Uh, economic power right now. Um, oh, I do think absolutely. that I do think that is some of the uh, behind the scenes conversations when the the majority is focusing on the wall. I think they're also yeah. looking at you know trade deficits and such and how we can still become a huge economic power. Well, here's another concept just to throw into the mix because that's just the type of mind I have. Um, when you talk about more male children than female children, there is the whole T. Gandhi thing. You know, again, we don't often think about parasites as being um, able to control much of anything. But um, T. Gandhi is the, uh, is the famous cat virus. You know, when okay. you see a, a lot of cat people where they got 75 cats, chances are they're infected with T. Gandhi. I mean, just chances are. Um, but one of the things uh, when they were looking at this, particularly in India, was that um, T. Gandhi, when it's part of the system, and it is a, it's like a, a protozoa, and what it does is it... Um, you know, cats have it, and the, the cycle means it goes to, to rats, to mice, and, and rats, when they are infected, they, they get off on cat urine. So, of course, they go looking for cats, and then, of course, the cats eat them, and then the cycle repeats, right? Well, mm -hmm. when, it comes into, when it gets into the human cycle, um, it gets interesting because it skews birth rates, um, particularly towards male, not female. Mm -hmm. And um, why this is, we don't know. But it's, it's one of the, uh, again, one of the, I've always been fascinated because parasitism is, I mean, it's, I, I figure, it's like 80% of most creatures on Earth are parasites. You know, <laughs> I mean, it's like, and then there's the 20%, right? <laughs> and, uh, you know, but um, that is, but there was a whole thing of how is it, well, whether or not that parasites can actually control the mind and, you know, on mind control. And we know that, you know, parasites can do this to certain ants and fish and stuff like that. I mean, literally, they, it supports their, their life cycle, and, and which is a really fascinating thing. And it was once thought that the human brain actually, and, and again, it's a, a, a theory that has not been really developed yet, maybe one of the reasons why we have the brains we have and the, is to prevent um, parasitic takeover. And, um, I, let, I mean, again, it sounds really weird, like something out of, you know, <laughs> the body snatchers or something like that. But, uh, 
this, these are real things, and um, they do exist in nature. And, um, you know, again, we do have things happening on a much broader scale sometimes underneath the surface. We think it's all this, you know. Well, you know, China is saying, well, you know, it's Singles Day. We just controlled the population, or mm-hmm. India says this, when in actual fact, you know, when you really start looking at all the information, the information shows a different picture that you may find that, you know, you do have T. Gandhi, you know, in excess in India and you have a whole view on men and women there that is just strange and you go well was that the result of people thinking that way but then how do you know you're thinking that way if you're infected by a parasite if you know what I'm saying Absolutely. Yeah, I mean it's a, it's it's a weird concept but one which does has some legs actually <laughs> yeah, I was just thinking that that is another rabbit hole which you know we can go down uh, but not oh, today. Love, <laughs> not today. I love rabbit holes and I tend to go down them. So anyway, there you go. So let's go to another rabbit hole. So I want to give a shout out, personal shout out to Tim Ferriss because if it weren't for him in 2007, 2008 when he wrote the 4-hour work week, he introduced this whole expat life. And so 10, 11 years later, I know a ton of people via the internet, you know, we connect with people that way. Um they're living in all these places like Venezuela, Mexico, Spain, Italy, Rome. One place that you don't usually hear is Uruguay. And I, was, I am really interested as to why if you kind of spun the globe and you just bl- closed your eyes and it ended up at Uruguay, what, what was the <laughs> thought what process to thinking? winding up there? I can think with that. Uh, first of all, just a shout out to Tim Ferriss one more time. He's a real big believer in mate, and mate is yerba mate is like the national drink of Uruguay. So that's also uh, one of ah. But no, here's um how this happened was we were look we were realizing that we were getting you know that whole you know frog thing in the boiling water. <laughs> Yes. Well, eventually even the frogs recognize that something is going on that's not right. And um, so we were sort of looking at this, and we were being squeezed a bit. And um, we were, again, profit margins. Um, my wife, I work for my wife. She's my boss. Um, she has a uh, translation company, and we were looking at, you know, just, again, the future and uh, cost taxes, and we started doing some of the math, and we were going, yeah, we're living fine, but we are getting, you know, all of a sudden, you know, you feel like you're being pressed up against the ceiling sort of thing, and we went, you know, this is not such a comfortable place to be when um, – our family, um, particularly her family, is you know when came from Colombia, so everybody's into football and soccer, like in a big way. Mm-hmm. And so when the World Cup came, you know, of course, Uruguay's in the semifinals, and we're going, whoa, you know, hey, where's that? And um, how mm-hmm. did that little country get to be so good? You know, and that was an interesting thing. And then it turns out, oh yeah, they even won the World Cup one year. You know, <laughs> and you go, how did that happen? So we started to look at this, and um, we had certain criteria of where we were going to go. We didn't want to do Colombia because politically we felt that that was a little bit too hot. And yeah, you know, we love. I love Colombia. They tend to be a little, you know, they're that's a hot bunch of dudes there. Anything is possible. <laughs> You know, so that's, that was one thing. So we needed some place that was either speaking English or Spanish. We didn't like snow. We didn't like earthquakes. Um, we wanted some place that was temperate, that had four seasons, um, and was sort of off the beaten track. Well, you know, when we started to zone in on this, um, Uruguay came up on the re- on the radar screen, and then I said, well, you know, well, what's the banking situation there? And so we looked over that, and we looked over their, you know, their economy. Their, you know, again, did a, a bit of a case study to find out, you know, well, how how cool is this place? Well, we were really surprised enough to say, okay, well, we should check it out. So we went for ten days, and. We were blown away. I mean, I don't know. Maybe it's uh, the fact that (laughs) the magnetic pole is up north and we're down here. The air, everything, it's different. I mean, you feel remote. And it's such an extraordinary sensation. I mean, it's physical. And we said, you know, we got to love this place. And, And just things worked out. We found a place and we said, wow, this is a cool place. And so we said, okay, well, we came back and we sold the house. 
you know, four months. Um, yeah, that was in September. <laughs> said, oh, wow. September of this, uh, 2018? You got it, Dave. Yeah. Whoa. Oh, yeah, man. We just said, okay, you know, there's a window here. And you know what? That window is closing. And you could sense it. It was like, you know, it's like that thing about where you, you know, you know, white men come, many horses, when the little, when the guy listens to the ground, you know, those movies. Yes. Well, yes. You know, just know that the cavalry that's coming ain't for you. <laughs> It's, it's not on your side. It's the um, the opposing squad that's cavalry that's coming. And we said, oh, man, you know, there's something happening here. And we have a very limited window, and we need to crawl through it as fast as we can. So we uh, we ramped it. And um, we just said, we looked at all the numbers and said, you know, we could actually do this. This is extraordinary. We could actually get off the treadmill. We could work if we don't want to. We could work if we do. Now, we're going to work probably till the day I die. But, you know, it's like... But at least it's, it's our choice. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a whole different concept on having to because you have to and doing something because, you know, I want to do this. And, the, and that's how Uruguay came into the – it's still expensive. You know, oh, my gosh, you know, some of the real estate over here is just as expensive as California. But wow. it's not an extraordinary people. Um, it is really chillax. It's, it's, it's inverted in the sense that – there's a lot of heart here and a lot of, and the outward appearance, you know, there's graffiti, there's things crumbling, you know, you go, my God, welcome to the third world. But, you know, you talk to the people and each one of them is unique and cool and you go, whoa, who did I just speak to? Then you go to the United States and everything's beautiful. I mean, we went back and there we, we came in in the middle of the night on the 405 freeway. <laughs> driving home, you know, and we're going, there's not, there's like eight lanes, barely a car anywhere, everything is beautiful, and we're going, wow, I had no idea that this country was so clean, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, um, but, you know, they, where's the substance, and so that was the thing, so uh, we said, it, it was really, so that's, that's, that's why we, we did it, and we looked at it from many, many I mean, we tend to do that. At least I do. I look at it from multiple perspectives on how to. Oh, I, I get work. it. I get that rabbit hole. That was a rabbit hole for you. Yeah, that was a rabbit hole for me. So anyway, there you go. <laughs> I mean, yeah, we're just fraught with rabbit holes down here. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, that, it, it's good. It's one of those myths of the 1%. I remember you know, hearing years ago from Ted Turner and Jane Fonda and others that, you know what, that cavalry may, may not be for us. So we're seeking sanctuary outside the U.S. And so I do think that there is a movement happening um, that a lot of people aren't talking about, and you kind of shed light on it just a smidge. Yes, I think, and there is a, I, I do believe that is the case. I mean, we talked to a lot of our friends, and what they couldn't believe was the rapidity of, with which we do things. I mean, I'm, well, I don't know. You know, it's just, um, that's the way I am. That's the way my wife is. Um, we, once we decide on something, I mean, it's, you know, you know, it's balls to the wall. We're going to do it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and that's what we did. But um, that, it resonated with so many of our peers, you know, and that was, that was interesting. Um, they were all, when it turns out, in their heart of hearts, looking for either easing out of the urban environment or finding a bit of a way to, you know, to ease off the clock here a little bit. And, you know, again, the financial pressures are such that it becomes really, really difficult. And just to segue all the way back to the 1%, one of the things that, that really marks the 1% is they have enough wealth to sustain themselves in spite of economic downturns and mm. other, you know, transient sort of emergencies. Uh, and, mm. and that's really, and that's how you could probably view it in terms of making, you know, oh, I make a million dollars or I make 780,000. I'm part of the 1%. Not, you know, it's just, it's, it's, that's not the way it is. You have to have a chunk so that you can, you know, you can manage it and, you know, the, it can smooth out a lot of the, you know, the bumps in the road, so to speak. And um, anyway, I mean, not that, you know, we're monstrously wealthy down here. We're, you know, we're having to, you know, the business still continues. That's one of the great things about the Internet, man. You can be anywhere. Absolutely. 
You know, Absolutely. it's one of the greatest gifts and one of the greatest curses, you know. It's one of those. Yeah, it's uh, along the Internet. It, it's uh, I'm in the digital marketing space, and so that is a, a school of thought with uh, pay-per-click. It's like if you have the bigger budget, you know, you can kind of just wait out the smaller firms, and once they blow their budget at, like, noon, <laughs> you have the rest of the day to kind of just <laughs> yeah. get a king's ransom. They'll be right to eat their lunch. No, I totally understand. <laughs> Yeah, it is. I mean, I always looked at the Amazon model, you know, and I said, wow, you know, those guys are really interesting. They got low prices, but, you know, what do you bet they're going to blow out all the competition and then they'll jack them? Because remember, you you it. Know, it all depends on the margins. And, you, know, you got it. Yeah, baby. That's the way that's going to go. So You're uncovering so much. Oh, my goodness. I don't even know if we can post it. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> well, I yeah, do want to ask you here. Sure. I want to ask you, and I'm sorry, David. I know I just totally just like ran over the uh, everything with Ivan. Uh, did you have another question, David? I was going to ask him what, how how big is Uruguay? I mean, like population wise, it's about 3.3 million. There are 3.8 cattle for cows for every person that gives you, and uh, they don't have a thing on grass fed beef because everything is grass fed beef. And, um, yeah, it's about 3.3 million, so it's not big. Wow. It's, uh, Montevideo is, um, you know, most most of uh, the population is on is around Montevideo and then sort of eases out towards the um, – when you go north towards Brazil, it can get very sparse. I mean, obviously, with Brazil getting sort of difficulties, you have – interesting sort of criminal elements moving into that area and that's caused a bit of a concern um yeah it's uh that is the only thing on on that one but most of the population is on the coast the coast is really cool and the river is so big you can't see the other side it's amazing so you know size wise would you say what size like state state of, state of washington state of washington yeah so mm. it's it's uh, and you, believe it or not, if you look on the map, it looks a lot smaller than the state of West uh, of Washington. But that has to do with the projection of the map you're looking at. Everything does those Mercator projections, and of course they give a uh, an incorrect view of just how freaking big South America is. South America always looks well; it's the size of Africa, you know, or something. Well, mm. I assure you, man, when you're you take six hours to get to Panama City, and then you know clip on another nine to ten to get to Uruguay. You know, uh, it, it, you just don't see that on the map. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So it is. It is huge. Um, South America is gigantic. <laughs> That's mm-hmm. all I can say. It is like, whoa, and it's full of people. And man, I tell you, these, you know, it's just they're wonderful. I, I, I'm, you know, we're thrilled to be here. One of our first podcasts, Ivan, was uh, talking about Godwinks, and that there's no coincidences ever. And so over, you know, over the holidays, had some downtime, and I was, I was watching, you know, I watched Joe Rogan and some of these other folks, and they were talking about the FBI files from the World War II were public domain now, so uh, you can access them. And they, were, they created this show on History Channel called Finding Hitler. And so they were saying, you know, in history, the traditional history in the States is, you know, he died uh, during the war. But in all of this, this new data that had come out, he had an escape route and all this stuff. And so they had like over three years following how the, uh, how the Germans had escaped Germany and created these, these new forts around South America, like Brazil and, and – uh, Uruguay, and I'm sitting here, and I'm like, wow, I would love to talk to somebody from Uruguay, and we're talking, talking to you today, and yes, it, was right. just, it was just interesting of, of, of the history that we're taught and the history that actually really exists, and so it would be interesting since you just moved one. there. I know. Well, it is. I mean, most of that stuff was happening in Buenos Aires, because remember, um, when you go down south uh, of Buenos Aires to, um, you know, Patagonia, I mean, you have places that look just like um, Bavaria. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's freaking amazing. So, you know, it is possible. Um, They also had, you know, these wonderful, you know, uh, 22 type and 23 type U-boats, which were... (laughs) 
know, they looked just like modern submarines. You know, these were pretty intense. So, yeah, somebody wanting to get away, that could have happened. Whether it did or not, I don't know. I think people spent an awful lot of money, you know, trying to find out, you know, whether or not it was really him. And a lot of the, the, the information of whether or not he really died in the bunker, you know, the, the Soviets, because they took Berlin. And, um, mm -hmm. yeah, I think that's, you know, probably I would imagine – that probably is the case, um, you know, but who knows? It's a, you know, nothing would surprise me anymore. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think we get to that age where you're like, nothing, yeah, just tell yeah, me another okay. one. Just keep following yeah. it. <laughs> you know, show me something new, baby. I want to know something. But, no, yes. but anyway. Well, I do want to say, because we are at the top of the hour, um, you do have a, a, a trailer on your site talking about Eye of the Moon. I'd like for you to talk a little bit about the Eye of the Moon, where people can find it, uh, your website, so they can see your other blog posts and all that good stuff. Sure. Um, the, the, you can buy the book at Amazon. I mean, you can do Kindle, I mean, two ninety nine. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, Kindle Unlimited, it's a freebie. Um, you can also get a hardback and a paperback, either or. Um, they're very cool. Uh, you can do, again, Amazon handles it. Um, we do like Amazon from the viewpoint of being a publisher, you know, KDP Select, you know, boom, you know, it's one stop, one shop, and it does work. So, you know, you can buy the, that there. My website, IvanOpolensky.com, um, I-V-A-N-O-B-O-L-E-N-S-K-Y.com. That gets to the uh, the book website, um, the all the articles of which there's about a hundred on you know everything from you know finance to you know biochemistry, and that's um, that's a dynamic doing this. But I think there's a link on my website that actually takes you to the articles, and that's it. And you know the book is doing great. Uh, we got a lot of good reviews. People really like it. And I'm writing a sequel. Just because my publisher, my wife, pounded on me and said, you know, we got to do, stop what you're writing right now. Go write the sequel. You need to write the sequel. I sat there and said, okay, we're writing the sequel. Got to move to Uruguay. But anyway, so that's how we <laughs> Nice. And I will say, again, just on the selfish part of me and, and others like me, we highly anticipate the audible version of it. Oh, 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 yeah, just yeah, just turn that knife a little. Yeah, I know. Don't, <laughs> don't even go there. But no, you're right, and and I quite agree. And one day, you know, you will probably be able to hear it on an audible edition, and I, and that would really that would make my day. Frankly, it was supposed to happen, you know, before the end of the year, but that didn't quite work out the way it's planned. No problem, no problem. Well, you have just been in tune to another episode of Intrinsic Motivation from a Homie's Perspective. This is Hamza. And I am David. It was a pleasurable hour spending with you, Ivan. Let's definitely stay in touch. Please do. And, um, yeah, if you've got any questions or whatever, you know, I can, you know, just say, hey, I need, I've got a free hour here, you know, and I'll, I'll be ready for you. Nice. Cool. Thanks for your cool. time. And thank you very much. Cheers. Ciao. Listen to Intrinsic Motivation from a Homie's Perspective on Radio Public. It's a free, easy-to-use app that helps listeners like you find and support shows like ours. When you listen to our show on Radio Public, we receive direct financial support every time you hear an episode. Experience our show in Radio Public today by listening to the show link in our episode notes, and thank you for listening.